quick thumbs up. I can hear you perfectly fine. I also want you to know that uh, all the participants will not be able to unmute themselves, but whenever you guys are ready for questions, you can prompt me and I can allow them to. Marvelous, thank you. Um, welcome to the Innovative Pilot Session here at the 2024 Mobilizing Justice Symposium. Really excited to be sharing with everyone about some really interesting work that's been going on. Um, we're going to have two pilots today presenting about uh, micro mobility and sustainable active transportation and equity analyses of new technologies, including uh, e bikes and e cargo bicycles or e cargo cycles. Um, in fact, both of our topics uh, presentations today are basically on uh, looking at the equity impacts of, of e bikes, which are this this new ish mode that is uh, shaking up. Uh, urban mobility. And then I will give a brief overview about some of the other projects we have underway and some lessons we've learned from implementation. But before we do that, for folks who are new, I want to give you a refresh on what this working group is. So the Innovative Pilots and Technologies Working Group was tasked with funding eight equity evaluations of new transportation technologies so, you know, thing, everything from, you know, Uber and Lyft to e-scooters and whatnot, as well as innovative policies. Um, bus rapid transit, I mean, it's been around for a while, but we're still innovating in the space. Um, congestion pricing, uh, things like that, as well as new infrastructure. And the goal of this working group was to try and fund rigorous experimental or quasi-experimental analyses that could capture the impacts of some of these new technologies uh, and policies on equity. And so that could mean a lot of different things, but in the spirit of trying to sort of move away from just, I don't know how to say this, battling the potential dystopias that we maybe face around new transportation technology, trying to envision where, when, and how new policies and technologies can actually be intentionally created to or put in place to advance equity and advance justice. What are the problems that we can solve? And what does it look like to deploy these changes to help solve problems or barriers to uh, transportation equity? And so in that spirit, we're going to jump right into our presentations. Our first presentation is led by a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto, uh, Marsha Rahman, who's going to be speaking about early results from an e-cargo cycles pilot. So this is a pilot evaluation on um, e-cargo bikes. And also Darnell Harris from our Greenways will also be involved. Darnell, are you here? Um, yes, I'm no? here. Oh, what... Um, uh, this was actually a project initiated by Mr. Harris. And ah, there you are. Okay, and we've made you a co-host. Wonderful. So um, I don't know which of you wanted to go first, but I'll take it let, let y'all take it away. Thank you, uh, Matt. And I'm going to start my presentation. Let me share my screen. Already, I hope everyone can share my see my screen, right? Yes. Cool. Right. Okay. Um, welcome to our presentation. Um, today we are going to talk about electric cargo bikes, and we are going to share some early findings um, from our pilots that we have been doing since last year in Toronto. I am Dr. Mashur Rahman, a postdoctoral fellow at University of Toronto. And with me are Dr. Stephen Farber and Darnell Harris. Um, why we became interested in electric cargo bikes? Um, E-cargo bikes allow us to do a lot of activities that we cannot do with the traditional uh, bicycle. Uh, we can carry goods, uh, stuffs, and pets, and even uh, people. Uh, children um, with, in the cargo space. And also 
it cover a longer distance um, with the battery powered electric cargo bikes compared to conventional bikes. And uh, most important, it's fun. Uh, it keeps us fit and we can have fresh air while riding. And it helps us to interact with people that we cannot do in cars. Um, so this type of um, electric cargo bikes has the potential uh, to substitute car. And oftentimes we see that uh, people, even people are used to uh, traditional bicycles, they shift to cars when it comes to carry goods and transporting children, people from one place to another. And this is where electric cargo bikes are uh, maybe a game changer in urban transportation um, because uh, it gives us more freedom and allows more activities uh, to be done. And it saves us money and time. And it's very expensive to own a car, uh, uh, especially in a city like Toronto, where if we consider ownership of car in terms of depreciation, insurance, well, all sorts of things, it's really expensive. Um, so, and also uh, electric cargo bikes are uh, emission free. We can save, we can reduce tons of carbon emission uh, from subst by substituting car trips with the cargo bike trips. Uh, this type of electric car, uh, this type of cargo bikes are, um, nothing new. This has been around for centuries. And then we saw a decline of e-cargo bikes and the rise of vans, automobiles, cars. And recently with the COVID-19, we see a resurgence of uh, cargo bikes um, because of the delivery service skyrocketing after COVID. And uh, many cities are thinking about uh, electric cargo bikes for uh, transporting goods and delivery services. And the City of Toronto Council approved um, e-cargo bikes uh, uh, ordinance in 2020. And then Ontario uh, Cargo e-bike pilot program launched in 2021, which allows the uh, municipalities to opt into permitting cargo bikes by passing their own bylaws. And then later we saw Toronto update uh, their own bylaw in 2021, um, allowing e-cargo bikes that weighs more than 120 kilograms. Uh, and there has been some research, a number of research on electric cargo bikes for uh, delivery purpose for goods and business uh, commercial purpose. Uh, but few studies have focused on personal use. So in these pilot projects, we uh, are concentrating on electric cargo bikes for personal use, and our objectives are twofold. First, we try to understand whether um, by demonstrating electric cargo bikes in public events influence people's willingness to adopt them for personal use, and then to understand a more general understanding um, and idea about potential user groups and what types of trips could be substituted by electric cargo bikes? Uh, what are the barriers and opportunities of adopting this type of transportation? Um, and for this pilot projects, we have two components. First is on-site survey. We, demo we organized public demonstration of electric cargo bikes and we conducted on-site survey. The main purpose of this survey is uh, uh, very short and simple so we can collect data very, within a very short amount of time. And um, it is also gives us an opportunity for face-to-face -face interaction and talk with people and understand their opinion and uh, what they think about this, their initial impression. And then we conducted a larger follow-up survey uh, with more detailed, uh, targeting a more detailed information about people's travel behavior, attitude, um, and uh, more detailed information about their um, future use. Uh, so on this demonstration, in this demonstration event, we uh, showed a variety of e-cargo bikes. You see like they range from, they can be uh, a front loader, which have a cargo space in front. Then we have a long tail bikes uh, where we can carry uh, goods uh, on the backside, backside of the cargo space of the electric bikes. And then 
uh, we can attach a trailer uh, with the bikes. So we showed this type of, this variety of bikes to people in our demonstration events. And um, I invite Darnell Harris to share our experience of these events. Thank you, everyone. Um, pleasure, pleasure to connect today. And just a note, I'm currently uh, in a cargo bike factory in Mexico. So if you hear some ringing or some other noise, that's why. Um, so in any case, as mentioned, our Greenway organized uh, 22 of these events across Toronto. You can see the, the piece there. And it was very much intended, as Masha was saying, to get a sense of you know, what other parts of the city felt, because we usually focus mostly on downtown and really, you know, showing people these tools and what can, can be accomplished. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So this sort of shows, you know, a sense of where we've been starting from uh, Corkton Commons, Evergreen, then we went to uh, something in the in near Dundas in the east in so the eastern ends. Um, also, you know, in the west in Davenport, um, that lovely one there with um, the Muslim ladies was in RV Burgess and Thorncliffe Park, and also Black Creek Farm. And really, you know, what you get a sense of is the interest you have from youth, the interest you have from people of all ages. Of, of seeing these and many in many cases for the first time. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. So we did the same again this year, going, you know, once again, a mix of the suburbs downtown. We had the deputy mayor, Osmo Malik, see it as well as we're able to get out to Scarborough and other places, including, um, you know, the Albion Islington area in uh, Doug Ford's ward. And really, you know, again, we saw the same thing. People were interested. People were curious. They were asking questions. And people ultimately felt that they saw tools that they could use. Um, so at that point, I'll turn it over to Mashur to uh, speak about our results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darnell. Uh, now I'm going to share uh, the results of from both of our on-site survey and follow-up survey. First, let's turn on to the, uh, into on-site survey. So far, we have gathered around 253 uh, response from our on-site survey, and we asked them um, to understand about um, uh, the frequency of using bicycle. And uh, we can see from the results that uh, a majority of the uh, participants had some sort of experience of bicycling and we see um, around 52% uh, of them um, use bicycle at least few times a week or more. Uh, and then uh, we asked them what purpose they use um, bicycle and we see uh, of course, uh, a large number of them use for recreation or entertainment, but also it's interesting that um, a considerable number of them use for uh, utilitarian purpose. For example, groceries, uh, running personal errands, visiting families, friends, and work purpose. Uh, and then, uh, we also ask them uh, that if they see uh, the potential use of e-cargo bikes for these following trip purposes. And uh, we try to compare who are currently, between who are currently using bicycle for each of these activities and who are not using uh, bicycles for these activities. Um, and we see uh, that people who are currently using bicycles are more likely to use electric cargo bikes. Uh, from the right side of the figure, we see uh, that like the people who currently use bicycle for groceries, for personal running personal errands, visiting friends or families, they are more likely to use electric cargo bikes. Uh, 
but also people who are not currently using uh, bicycle, uh, they are also interested to use electric cargo bikes. For example, groceries, 71% of the respondents who are not using bicycle for groceries, they are intended to use electric cargo bikes for groceries. And maybe a lot of them uh, use uh, public transit or walk uh, for groceries currently. Um, in the follow-up survey, uh, we ask more detailed information about uh, what types of modes they are using for these uh, trips. And we are going to see the results in our next slides. Uh, we asked them about their intention to purchase e-cargo bikes, and we see around 45% of the respondents intend to use purchase and uh, uh, purchase a bike uh, in the next 12 months. Uh, and 42% of them intend to buy it for personal use. And interestingly, uh, those who intend to buy any sorts of bike in the next 12 months, uh, for 38 percent of them um, intend to buy an electric cargo bikes. So this is encouraging that people are seeing the use and the uh, usefulness of electric cargo bikes and they are going to uh, they are considering buying this type of bikes uh, for their regular for their personal use. Um, and then we also, asked people to rate different types of electric cargo bikes and we see the results uh, in general. Uh, the overall ranking of uh, the electric cargo bikes, which are more likely to uh, resemble the size and feature of a traditional bikes have the highest rating uh, because people see uh, they can carry their cargo on the backside of the uh, bicycle and also it gives higher flexibility in maneuvering and movement, and they can uh, park uh, this type of cargo bikes uh, in the existing bike racks. Uh, so this type of bikes are more popular than the others. Uh, then I'm going to share about our follow-up survey results. In the follow-up survey, our main intention was to gather more detailed information, uh, especially people's perceived needs, uh, their barriers, their attitude, their current travel behavior, and their socio-demographic characteristics. Uh, and first, we asked them about whether demonstration, whether they did uh, engage any of these activities after the demonstration. And we see that uh, although only five people uh, purchased actually an electric cargo bike following the demonstration, but uh, around three fourth of the survey participants uh, engage some sort of activities after the demonstration. For example, visiting a bike shop or talking to friends, family, or suggesting someone or doing their own research. So demonstration has some positive cognitive influence on uh, purchase intention of electric cargo bikes. And then we ask the same questions about their intention to purchase an electric cargo bikes. And we see, uh, around 26% of them are considering purchase any type of bikes in the next 12 months. And a large majority of them um, are interested in purchasing e-cargo bikes. Uh, if we see the right side of the bar chart, uh, around uh, 20 of the responders, they are more likely to consider uh, intent, uh, of uh, buying an electric cargo bike in the next 12 months. And we group the uh, participant based on the potential users and unlikely users. Uh, if they responded, they are more likely to purchase an electric cargo bikes, then we group them as a potential users. And then we compare their social demographics. And we find that uh, people who are younger, who are not white, male, have children, and who belong in lower income group, and who are renters and currently own a bike, they are more likely uh, and who do not have a car, they are the more likely adopters of electric cargo bikes. And we also ask them what purpose they're going to use it. And we see uh, a lot of majority of them intend to purchase an electric cargo bike for groceries, other shoppings, personal errands. Uh, these are the uh, more uh, 
like people report this type of use because they can substitute their car trips or they can use uh, this type of uh, instead uh, of using cars or bicycle, they can use electric cargo bikes for this type of trips. And we also ask them about their current travel behavior and their willingness to use an electric cargo bikes for different uh, purposes. Um, and here we see that uh, electric cargo bikes actually has the potential to substitute car trips. For example, 74% uh, of, the, of the participants who are currently using car for uh, groceries, they are going to substitute their car trips with an electric cargo bike tips. Um, and same for shopping, we see the shopping and errands. Uh, these are the trips that people are considering substituting car trips with an electric cargo bikes. And uh, finally, we, are, uh, we also asked them about the barriers of purchasing an electric cargo bikes. And the main barrier the respondents report is the lack of safe parking place. Around 60% of the respondents say they do not have a parking available at their home uh, for electric cargo bikes. And it's expensive and they're afraid that their bikes can be stolen. And among other barriers they reported, poor road conditions um, and they're heavy to handle and the weather condition, um, and Toronto bike lanes are not good for electric cargo bikes. Um, and also they fear that um, in terms of uh, an accident, it can be very severe if they ride in electric cargo bikes. So in our next step, uh, we are trying to do a cluster analysis based on uh, people's current travel behavior, uh, their attitude, their perception, uh, so we are uh, going to have some idea who are the potential users. Um, for example, we can target these respondents for designing incentives uh, uh, for electric cargo bikes. And um, we are we will continue our second phase of the follow-up survey. And alongside uh, um, the participants for bicycle demonstration, we are going to recruit additional uh, samples who did not actually participate in the event. So we can have, um, we can compare the control group versus treatment group, um, and we can have a better understanding whether this type of demonstration has a positive impact on our, um, on people's willingness to adopt e-cargo bikes. And also we'll have a larger sample uh, for our analysis. So that's all from our side. Thank you. Let us know if you have any question. Excellent. Thank you so much, Darnell and Marshur. That was a wonderful presentation. We're going to hold questions to the end. Um, and I, I see folks are already responding in the chat. Uh, and so with this, we will move on to our second presentation of the session from Dr. Alex Bagazi, who's an associate professor uh, in transportation engineering at the University of British Columbia. And this talk is about a really exciting pilot that is ongoing around income conditioned uh, e-bike incentives um, that were run in British Columbia. And so with that, Dr. Bagazi, I will turn it over to you. Apologies. I forgot where unmute was. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to be here and uh, present um, and share a little bit about uh, an update and a summary of uh, some ongoing work uh, looking at income conditioned e-bike incentives in BC. So this is uh, research that's funded by SHRC through the Mobilizing Justice uh, Research Grant. And I wanna thank uh, Megan Winters over at Simon Fraser University, our sister university here in the Vancouver region. Uh, she's a co-investigator on this project and Amir and Paulina, fantastic grad students working on the project. And of course, super importantly, our project partners, the District of Saanich and the province of British Columbia, who are the ones who have actually implemented these e-bike incentive programs that we've been looking at. Um, 
So we've had a couple here. Uh, the District of Saanich, which is out on Vancouver Island in the greater Victoria region, uh, um, a kind of a, a real leader in climate. They just uh, elected one of our few green MLAs uh, last Saturday. So the District of Saanich uh, really took leadership uh, in this space and launched a income, uh, income conditioned e-bike incentive program in 2021. And we were fortunate uh, to be able to work with them on that project. Uh, some of the design was based on some pre-program um, modeling that we had done. And so we worked with them to um, evaluate the impacts of that program over the course of a year. And that report is now out and available. Um, and you can download it from our website. I can put the link in the chat later. Um, <clears throat> Since then, the province of BC, it was a very successful program, and since then, the province of BC scaled up and adapted that program to a province-wide uh, uh, e-bike incentive program with a similar structure, but with some tweaks to the design based on um, some administrative issues and concerns and, and a slightly different set of priorities. Both these incentive programs had um, funding and motivations that were jointly related to uh, active transportation policies like the Cycling BC strategy, as well as climate policies like the Clean BC Action Plan uh, and equity um, uh, uh, policies as well. And so this was kind of a triangulation of active transportation, uh, environmental uh, and equity um, initiatives at both the local level within the District of Saanich and at the provincial level. So the province launched their program two summers ago in 2023. And so that is the focus of, of this research is looking at the impacts of that provincial program. Um, both programs were oversubscribed immediately, essentially wait lists from day one, pretty much. Um, both programs have three incentive tiers. So what we have is the largest, uh, the largest rebates are only available to income conditioned purchasers. And so we had a $350 rebate that was available to anyone in those geographies a middle tier that was for moderately low income, and then a high rebate amount that was only available to the lowest income. And there were some differences in um, what those income thresholds were. And also fairly importantly, the Saanich program was based on a household income, whereas the BC program was based on a personal net income. Um, but with this larger provincial wide program, we have a lot more heterogeneity uh, within the incentive recipients, and we have a lot more spatial heterogeneity as well heterogeneity as well. So we can look at uh, the influences of contextual factors and also dig deeper on um, uh, the, the income of moderating effects of purchase decisions and e-bike behavior, as well as intersection with other equity attributes. Um, so a, a real kind of simple high level conceptual framework here. So these incentive programs, um, these incentives are distributed to people who purchase e-bikes. Those e-bikes are used. Uh, some of that e-bike use displaces travel by other modes. And so we can look at the net changes in things like greenhouse gas emissions, physical activity during travel, um, travel costs, travel time, um, access, things like that. Um, but not all of those changes can be attributed to the incentives because some of that would have happened otherwise. So the real challenge here is trying to quantify that counterfactual of what would have happened if the incentive program did not exist, and then quantify the marginal impact. So the changes in travel uh, and associated impacts, associated outcomes that we can attribute to the existence of the program itself. Uh, and you know, from some of the pre-program economic modeling we did, um, it can be shown that income conditioning theoretically improves both equity in terms of preferential um, incentives available to lower income uh, households and travelers, but also the efficiency of the program if lower income travelers are more price sensitive. So there's there's the potential to kind of have um, benefits in both directions. So with this BC program, we are focused on the income dimension of equity, and that's because that's what these programs are designed for uh, or designed around. So we want to look at are there differential effects of the incentives on purchase decisions with income? And then subsequent to purchases, are the differential effects on use of the purchased e-bikes with income and associated outcomes like access to destinations, uh, mode shift, travel costs, et cetera? And are there income specific barriers to further utilization um, um, once they have an e-bike available uh, to them in the home? 
Um, and then, of, and then, as I said, um, because we have this much larger sample at, at the province level, we can look at uh, are there equity implications beyond income, um, particularly with other uh, sociodemographic attributes um, like uh, gender, ethnicity, newcomer status, things like that. Uh, so the study takes a three-wave panel survey design. We get people as close as possible to the e-bike purchase, um, which is um, kind of limited by the way the program is administered and the way they pull people off the wait list. Um, but we get them as close as possible to when they purchase the e-bike. Uh, and then we return three months later for a short-term follow-up and then 12 months after purchase for a long-term follow-up. We ask about their purchase decisions and then subsequently whether they still have the bike. Um, and if not, why not? And was it replaced, et cetera? In all three ways, we asked about typical weekly travel habits. And we also asked specific a question, specific questions about um, a few recent trips they made using the, the most recent trips they made using that purchased e-bike, as well as you know, typical household and demographic information, and then changes in subsequent waves. Um, so we are right now in the wave three uh, re-recruitment. Um, incentives are being, or sorry, invitations are being sent out. Um, so we finished wave one and two, and we've done some interim analysis, but the final analysis is waiting for um, all the wave three data to come in and we'll produce a final report, which will be available uh, in late spring. But I can give you a summary of kind of what we're seeing uh, so far based on those interim results. Um, and so again, responses are still coming in for wave three, but you can see the responses over time in the figure on the left. Uh, we got about 20, uh, I think almost 30, upper 20 percent of the uh, recipients into wave one. So uh, a, a decent, pretty decent program response rate. Um, almost a third of the program came into wave one. We had a little over 50 percent retention at wave two. So far, we have about a 60, 70 percent retention at wave three. But that um, is going up as we're um, continuing to send invitations. We're hoping to get that higher, of course. Uh, and then we had a pretty good distribution across the province, um, and we will be doing uh, geographic weighting, looking at you know, where the, the incentives were distributed across the province. Of course, they're concentrated in the population centers in the lower mainland uh, and the southern Vancouver Island in the Vancouver and Victoria regions. Uh, this is probably the most important uh, uh, results for the program impacts. And this uh, reflects the marginality uh, of the purchasers, which is to say um, what people would have done in that counterfactual world if the incentives were not available. Uh, and in this survey, we're relying on self-reported data for that. So we asked people what they would have done if the incentive had not been available. Uh, and they don't have to make a um, discrete choice. They can um, distribute and say, well, maybe I would have done this or maybe I would have done that and distribute the percentages. And so what you're seeing here is the average uh, likelihood of alternative behavior if the incentive had not been available. The orange and the red are non-marginal purchasers. So these are people who would have bought an e-bike anyway. And the blue and the purple are people who would not have bought an e-bike, what we can call marginal purchasers in the analysis. Uh, and so, Basically, the more blue and purple, the more of the behavior change we can attribute to the existence of the incentive program. And so we see a very clear laddering here, which is quite consistent with both the pre-program economic modeling based on a presumed um, price elasticity, elasticity of e-bike purchases, uh, as well as the results in Sandwich, where we see um, you know, the higher rebates um, for lower income people are um, have had a bigger impact on the purchase decisions. And so as a result, um, when we see behavior change, you know, roughly 21% of the behavior change for the non-income condition rebate recipients can be attributed to the existence of the program, whereas more than half uh, for the income condition incentives can be uh, attributed to the existence of the rebate program. Um, in terms of mode substitution, uh, overall, we're seeing about 40% auto mode substitution. Of course, when we're looking at you know, physical activity, greenhouse gas emissions, traffic congestion, et cetera, in general, what we want to see is as much auto mode substitution as possible. Um, it's not helping a whole lot if people are substituting conventional bicycle trips with e-bike trips. And so we see around 40%, upper 30s, um, auto mode substitution for e-bike trips. This is, again, this this um, result here on the slide is the self-reported 
uh, mode substitution for their recent trips. Um, this is also similar with the literature uh, and um, uh, the, in the SANES program. And I'll say uh, it is quite a bit higher than the mode substitution we see for conventional bicycle trips, uh, roughly, roughly twice as high. Um, this is just simple average changes in weekly PKT by mode between waves one and waves two for people who completed both waves. So this is now this is not yet um, controlling for a range of other factors that correlated with um, mode use and rebate amount. Uh, we'll be doing that in the final analysis, but just some simple aggregate summary data here. Uh, we can see for all three rebate levels, a very clear increase in e-cycling uh, in wave two compared to in their, their pre-purchase weekly travel habits, which is accompanied by a, a pretty clear reduction in, in automobile use as well. So that's what, um, in general, we want to be seeing. Uh, and as I said, we'll be doing um, uh, more detailed analysis once we have the full wave three data set, which will allow us to um, um, include more uh, contextual variables uh, like you know, weather, fuel prices, uh, terrain, uh, transportation network around the home location and things like that. Um, so that's where we're at now. We're gonna complete wave three data collection, uh, complete our calculations and, and do regression analysis that includes a lot of contextual factors. And the final report will be coming out in spring. Um, I'll just add, and I think in, in Musher's, one of the first slides he had, he mentioned this, but something that's really come out quite a lot in the kind of quantitative results, but also in the open comments and in um, some of the other program feedback we've had is that one of the big kind of outcomes that people um, spontaneously report and when they are asked to prioritize what has makes them use their e-bike and what led them to buy the e-bike, fun really has come out as something that's important for people that can motivates them to uh, continue to use it after the purchase. And I think that's, um, interesting and nice to see. And it's something that we're talking about more in transportation. And I like this kind of increased focus on fun as being, you know, a enjoyment as being a, a, a desirable outcome, but also a really important mechanism that is motivating uh, and, and motivating some of this behavior change and making it sticky. Um, and so we are looking at that as well. Um, I'll post the link to the Sanich report uh, in the chat and happy to answer at the end any questions y'all have. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bagazi. So um, I want to say this was the fastest 30 minutes of my life. Um, we are out of time already, and that was some really cool research. So I will save the general updates for this working group um, in an email to, to send out to folks and actually jump right into Q&A because it looks like both these talks uh, led to some really interesting questions in the chat that we want to get to. Um, but first, I want to introduce my co-lead on the pilot program, um, John Calamente. John is a senior policy analyst with the city of Vancouver who's going to moderate uh, the Q&A. So, John, take it away. Thanks very much, Matthew. Yeah, those were, um, it was really um, fascinating to hear the, the, res the initial results of, of both of, of the pilots. And um, yeah, we're really keen to hear more about these, these um, programs where we're incentivizing um, e-bike use. Um, maybe I'll start with um, um, the, uh, the second uh, presentation, just, just because we, um, we heard it last. Um, Alex, there was a question from Stephen on why do you think the automobile substitution rates aren't very differentiated by income he would assume that there's less car ownership in the low income group yet there's very similar substitution rates um great great question Stephen. and it, this is this is one of the very interesting things that um we haven't had a chance to fully pull out so i was hesitant to talk about it to, to kind of present it in the main body but um so there's two things here so first of all in the sandwich study we actually found higher so, well, higher auto usage, higher P weekly PKT in the lower income purchases. And we believe that is due to higher latent demand to shift some auto travel to e-bike use in the income conditioned, uh, in the lower income households, whereas the higher income households had 
had higher auto access, but we lower weekly auto use than the lower income households. So these were people who had already kind of realized the preference to use not automobile travel modes for a share of their purchases. So yes, in general, there is a broad societal preference to use automobiles for a lot of travel. And so when people have a higher income, they're better able to realize their preferences. But there is also a group of people who would like to not have to drive for all their travel. And for those people, lower income households are, are more constrained because they still have access to a car and the e-bike is, uh, and this is important, e-bike is not replacing car access, it is enhancing uh, their uh, automobile choices, or sorry, their travel choices. And so they're shifting some of their travel onto e-bike. But if you look, you know, there still is fairly high auto use in these households, right? So it's only replacing a portion of the trip. Um, but the second point is we didn't see as much variation across income tiers in the BC, so far in the BC results as we had previously seen in Saanich. And we believe that is related to how they conditioned the income on personal versus household income. And more high-income households were able to access the larger rebate amounts because there was someone in this, those households who had low income. Um, sorry, that was a very long answer, so I'll stop there. Thanks, Alex. Um, there was also a question on maintenance cost, and perhaps we can we can talk to both groups on this one. Is is, is it seen as a a barrier for um, the maintenance cost of e-bikes and e-cargo bikes versus uh, conventional bikes? Um, Maybe Mashur, do do you have any insight into that? And also, then I'll follow up with Alex. Sure, yeah, that's a good question. I think, uh, but the maintenance cost um, is not that much compared to car. Um, it's um, less than car maintenance cost, uh, but also it depends on the model. Uh, but I think the real save of money for e-cargo bike comes when people actually um, replace their uh, car with any cargo bikes. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, if they uh, keep an e-cargo bike and also keep a car, but then substitute only a few trips with any cargo bikes, then that will not be economical or save that amount of money. Uh, but the real savings will come when people scratch their car, then their fixed cost, uh, because the ownership of fixed costs spread over the use. So if they can totally scratch the car and then replace with the cargo bikes, that's, that's when the real savings come. Uh, but the main barrier, I think, is the huge upfront cost for the cargo bikes. Uh, okay. Um, Alex, any any comment on maintenance uh, for the, on the e-bike side? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, so our average purchase prices were around $3,000. And um, we actually found that um, those didn't change much with rebate amounts. So they were, so people were um, taking most of that as reduced cost rather than um, shifting it um, to uh, uh, higher priced e-bikes. Um, but people, um, I'll, I'll kind of echo that people focus more on the purchase price than the maintenance price, uh, the maintenance cost itself. Mm -hmm. And in terms of post-purchase kind of um uh, dissatisfaction with use it's more around parking uh, and some of these other things like infrastructure than um, the actual cost of maintenance which um, it ha hasn't really come up as a big factor sure um there was also i'm sure it had mentioned uh, e-cargo bike share um and i'm just curious uh, maybe darnell have, has is that been talked about in 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 your, your context as as potential um as a way to sort of not only introduce people to the idea of uh, e-cargo bikes but also um maybe allay some of those concerns if, especially if the the concerns that high upfront cost of, of purchase maybe they can get into it just by um through the share option yes definitely it has come up as a question the of course when it comes to cargo bikes the intention is you know what tool fix fits the context I know there was mention about, for example, um, car can cargo bikes go on transit? They can't go on buses or uh, streetcars, but they can go on, on the subway, depending on their size. And that's how we transport some of our bikes across the city. And so it depends on what tool you need. And definitely um, cargo bike share would help with that. But part of the problem is maintenance as well. 
So for us, for example, right. we work with, um, you know, although we do most of our work in Northwest Toronto, we work with um, curbside cycle and they do repairs or we have to get repairs, a repair personnel. So there's an ecosystem piece to all of this. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I think we're, uh, is that, Stephen, is that time? We're at 11 o'clock? Or, or um, do we have a bit more time? Maybe, maybe just one more question. One more question. Um, just curious, um, uh, both both groups, in terms of your survey results, were there anything unexpected that, that came out of, of your data so far, your survey data? And, and do, you, do you have any thoughts as to why? Why that was, um, it was different from what you intuitively would expect from, from your surveys? Alex, was there anything? Was it yeah, pretty much what I, you expected, I, or the the um, I kind of already mentioned it, but yeah, the the higher pre-purchase auto use in Sanich and that that we saw, and then which surprised me initially in the Sanich study, and then we got to the BC study, and I expected to see the same thing, and then we had different results in BC. So it it, it is definitely kind of understanding that that pre-purchase behavior for this subset of the population. And it's important to recognize that, you know, these aren't random and we really emphasize the point that this is not a, you don't, it, it, you will not get these types of results by randomly giving people e-bikes, right? So these are people who would like right. to have an e-bike and use it for some of their trips. And this reduces the barrier to them doing that. And so um, it's, it's important to recognize that, um, you know the, the the population the comparison population here is not everybody in BC but people who would like Limited. to e-bike more, um, yeah. And so it's 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 a little bit harder when we when we want to then extend that out to kind of some broader changes we can make, getting more people into this pool of people who would like to e-bike more. Right? Sure. Um, Masher Darnell, anything that that popped up? Uh, Masher, do you want to go first? Uh, one thing that uh, I have not re reported in my presentation, but uh, when we are doing different segment of user analysis, uh, then uh, the segment of user who are occasional car users, but also depend on the variety of transport mode like public transit and bicycle, um, their attitude and interest of e-cargo bikes are more than people who are solely depend on bikes and uh, mm. use less transit or less cars. So uh, that's uh, that's unexpected, but also interesting in the sense that uh, like people who are not very much dependent on the car, but have to use car along with other modes, they can be also uh, very interesting target groups for our study. Right, fascinating. And um, I'll just quickly add, what I found interesting, we had a bike in there called a Mastretta. And the Mastretta, frankly, is, you know, from a cargo bike perspective, a bit of a lemon. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, there's some pieces of it that aren't well, well built, for example. And people who knew about bikes or cargo bikes noticed that very quickly. However, it received much higher marks than we imagined, especially from people who are not familiar with it because they liked the fact that it had three wheels. They liked the color. They like some of the the way that it was built, and so you know it really showed that the design matters, and that certainly it influences people's decision making on that level. Yeah, great point. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, Alex Masher and, and Darnell for for your presentations, and uh, yeah, looking forward to further data in these areas. It's a it's a it's a growing topic of interest for for many many municipalities. So, um, really appreciate it. Um, I'll turn it back over to Jasmine. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to 